All right. Well, good morning, everyone. We are just excited to have you all here and thank you for joining us. I'm going to give it just a few more minutes. Um, so take your time, get a cup of coffee if you need to, and um, give some people time to log in. And, you know, while we're waiting just to give people a few more, just one more minute to log in, I just wanted to highlight um, some information. You know, I think many of you probably know that April is the National Child Abuse Prevention Month. So many of you have been wearing blue and um, just trying to raise awareness about that. And so this report that we released, we thought it was really good timing to release the report along with that just to elevate, you know, the importance of, um, you know, especially talking about how we can elevate youth voice and how we can just all work together to, um, you know, continue to make improvements to the child welfare system. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we are, you know, releasing our report this month. Uh, it's been a real labor for many of us to kind of think about how we are measuring transformation. Um, so uh, I want to introduce the people who are going to be joining me today to talk about it. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll introduce myself first. And um, my name is Kim Eckhart. I work for the Children's Defense Fund of Ohio. So we're a, a multi-issue statewide child advocacy organization, and we're committed to being an independent voice for children in the halls of power. So we want to make sure that all children thrive, and we cover many, a range of issues. Um, and this particular one uh, related to child welfare is um, especially important to us. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Deanna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Deanna Jones. I'm a consultant with uh, CDF. I'm excited to be here. Um, I was excited also to just join along to support the work um, that went into the Measuring Transformations Report because I was a caseworker and I was also a former foster youth. So this is very important to me and I'm so excited that you all were able to join us today. And I will turn it over to Layla Rose. Hi, I'm Layla Rose. Um, I am a third year law student. I'm just wrapping up in the last few weeks at The Ohio State University. Um, and I aged out of foster care in 2015. And um, I have just been doing this kind of work ever since I've worked with the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute in DC. And I've worked with the Children's Services Transformation Council. And um, ever since, I'm just very passionate about raising awareness for child welfare issues in general. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thanks, Layla Rose. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. I just want to start um, by saying that I think everybody here today can agree that um, every youth in Ohio should be given the opportunity to thrive as adults. And you'll see a big part of this report was um, includes some direct quotes, right? And I wanted to interview people who've been in foster care because I was doing my research. And when I asked them, you know, what does it mean to you to thrive as an adult? Um, there were a couple of themes, but, you know, the basic thing is just being able to pay the bills, right? Just being able to have food in the fridge, stable housing, um, and a car in the driveway. So, um, but then there's this other level to it, which is like, um, you know, healing from your past and being a part of meaningful change to the system. Um, and so we know that there's lots of things that we want to change about the way the child welfare system works. Um, and over the past few year, uh, years, leaders in Ohio have really started to invest in the child welfare system in new ways um, and have shown a commitment to improving outcomes. So the title of the report is called Measuring Transformation. And that really refers to 
the initiative started by the DeWine administration, you know, he appointed the Children's Services Transformation Advisory Council. Um, but, you know, from our perspective, um, thinking about why is transformation necessary? Um, and I think I want to share a little bit about the statistics that I found while I was doing this research. But before I do that, I just want to kind of tell a quick story um, about a person who kind of puts a face on these numbers. Um, and this is an actual, this is a true story of a, a young man who um, contacted some people. So we, we found out about the situation. Um, his name was changed, but it's, it's an actual story. Um, so, you know, at the time of this, he was a freshman in high school, funny, intelligent guy, um, noticed that he started to withdraw, started to, you know, drop out of his extracurriculars, his grades started dropping. Um, and, you know, what was happening was that he um, actually started couch surfing uh, because he didn't feel safe in his placement. Um, and so when he had tried to, you know, contact the right people to get his concerns addressed, um, they just, there wasn't a sufficient way to address them and those concerns were dismissed. Um, so when you think about somebody like this who starts couch surfing in high school, you know they're more likely to become a part of these statistics. Um, now, fortunately, the end of the story was actually positive. He had a sister, an older sister who was in college at the time, who was really able to fight for him to get him into a safer placement. Um, but this, um, this chart, you know, just shows what, what happens, you know, when people like that fall through the cracks. Um, you know, Ohio falls in the bottom 10% of the nation on four different measures of well-being for youth who are in foster care as teenagers. So we interviewed, you know, they were surveyed um, at the age of 21, and we found that they were less likely to have attained a high school diploma or a GED than their peers in other states, um, as well as um, other areas, including employment, um, whether or not they've been in college, you know, and continuing to be enrolled in school at age 21. So, um, and then, you know, and that's just the, those that are at the bottom 10%, we're also in the bottom 20% on a couple of other measures, including homelessness and whether or not youth reported having that connection with an adult. Um, now, what's even more troubling is that we know that this is disproportionately impacting youth who are black or multiracial that are involved in the child welfare system. So this you know, the other chart just shows how many times more likely it is for a child who is black or multiracial to be involved in the child welfare system at different stages. So it goes from referrals um, to investigations and then um, to out of home placements. And that last um, chart on, or that last bar graph on the out of home placements shows that, you know, youth who are, are black are three times as likely to be an out of home placement. Um, so we know that when you think about these other outcomes uh, related to um, high school, uh, you know, graduation, et cetera, we know those are disproportionately affecting youth of color. So we can um, go to the next slide. So when I started like working on this report, I was really curious, you know, what are the current performance measures that people think of when they think about child welfare in Ohio? And there's a whole section of the report that's devoted to just describing the measures and then how Ohio is doing on them. So I wanna highlight just a few findings from this section, um, you know, I. I talk about the uh, child and family service reviews. That's one piece of kind of the overall performance measurement picture. Um, and that's, that's really coming from the federal level. And you know, what's nice about those child and family service reviews is that there's, um, there are targets, right? There's a, there's a way to say, this is where we should be moving. And so I realized like the, you know, when I ask the question, does Ohio meet the national standards? This is not like an X check mark where it's like you're failing the test, but really it's saying, where are we and where do we need to be moving toward, right? Because the, those performance measures have standards attached to them so we can see kind of where we fall. And so Ohio really needs to move forward towards those targets more in the safety realm. Um, so you can see there's two kind of ways of measuring safety. One is safety while a child's still at home, and then there's safety while they're in care. And in both of those cases, Ohio really has more progress to make um, in terms of moving towards that national standard. Um, we do 
Ohio does pretty well when it comes to permanency. Um, we're, you know, the permanency is a measure of how, you know, how many children within 12 months achieve permanency. Um, so Ohio is doing well on that. However, there is kind of a safety aspect to that where it's once you're reunified, do you then re-enter care again within 12 months? And that's another area where Ohio needs to um, move closer to that um, national standard. And then finally, stability. Stability is one where Ohio does well. Um, I think during the pandemic, this one um, had a little bit more of a challenge, but for the most part, um, you know, children do move less frequently while they're in care in Ohio than in other states. So that's all related to the, the national or like the federal standards. Um, on the Ohio side, so you know, there are other types of performance measures that Ohio has identified um, at the state level. These aren't, they, these don't have the same kind of like, this is the target we're moving toward. Um, but, it, but it does, you know, identify some things that we should be thinking about and focusing on. So for example, um, the percentage of children placed in congregate care. Um, and this is, you know, there's a wide range. And I think we can all agree that, you know, children should be in the most family-like environment possible. And so when you think about the range of county level um, placement rates with as many as 63% in some counties, all the way down to 5% in other counties. So really just thinking about how can we ensure, you know, how can we kind of look into this and see how many children, um, uh, in each county are experiencing that. Um, another piece that I think is really interesting is that the number of children who aged out of care, obviously this is an important measure that um, we think of when we think about child well-being. Um, and in 2021, that number actually dropped down to not, uh, below 1,000, where it had kind of peaked in 20, uh, 2019 and 20 to be over 1,000 um, young people. And I think a real high point is that because there are so many um, youth who are aging out of care in Ohio, um, that this participation in Bridges, so Bridges is that program that allows, um, that provides services to youth beyond that kind of official year, you know, 18 year old um, age up to the age of 21. And so participation in that program where you can get um, support, uh, you can, as far as like, um, continued case management, continuing to kind of support you in um, extending foster care, providing housing and um, education resources, all of those kind of like wraparound supports. Um, participation in that program has increased by 20% each of the last two years. So there's been a real increase in that, which I think is a bright spot for Ohio. Um, and when you think about, you know, the, uh, the measures that we talked about at the beginning, as far as like um, youth who are enrolled in, or who graduate from high school and enrolled in post-secondary, Bridges is actually one of those programs where um, you can you can continue to participate in it if you're employed, if you have, if you're enrolled in school. So it kind of has that um, added benefit of capturing some of those well-being measures at the same time. So this, I think, shows that Ohio is moving in the right direction. Um, there's a couple of other things, you know, that I, I put in here as far as the key statistics. But I did want to um, hand it over, or actually, if you want to go to the next slide, I did want to make one point before I hand it over. And that's that, you know, all of you, I'm sure, are aware that uh, Ohio is a county administered system. We're one of nine states where, you know, we have the state supervision, but really it's the counties who are administering the child um, protective service and children's services. And so it's important to, to think about these performance measures from the county perspective and, and look at that in that way. And so we do have a county level snapshot for each of the different 88 counties. Um, you can go to that link in the chat. And um, what you'll see is that, you know, there's kind of, a, there's one piece where you can go kind of navigate on the website to a dashboard. And then there's another piece where if you wanna print out your county's report, um, there's a printer friendly version as well. So both of those are accessible. Um, so you can kind of see how your county is doing. Um, so with that, um, I'll just say, you know, this is a lot of data, right? And it's kind of nerdy and <laughs> maybe a little bit technical for many people. And while I was thinking about this, I really wanted to get the perspectives of people who had been in foster care about these all these different measures. I um, mean, what 
you know, the bottom line is that these existing measures, while they're great in some ways, they don't currently measure or capture the experience of youth while they're in care in a way that's meaningful and that can tell us if reform efforts are working. And so we're, you know, really committed to some specific reform efforts. Um, and we want to make sure, you know, we want to be able to collect data that tells us, are these measures working? Are we, is this going to have an impact? So I want to turn it over to my colleague, Deanna, um, and she's going to talk about some of the reform efforts that we're really committed to. And one, one effort, I think in particular, you know, when I talked about that young person um, who we called Marcus in the report, it will really address situations like that. Um, so I wanna turn it over to you, Deanna, and um, tell us a little bit more. Thanks. Um, well, again, thank you everyone. Um, our report on measuring transformation and elevating youth voice mentions several areas where leaders in Ohio are working toward change. The most important one from my perspective is the Youth Ombudsman Office. Um, Ohio, Ohio is really making strides to putting that in place and letting that be um, another place where youth can go to to have their concerns met. And so that's kind of the perspective that I'm speaking from today. It's a dual one. As I mentioned earlier, I am both an alumni of care, alumnus of care, and uh, I also worked in the foster care system here for over 11 years in multiple positions. And speaking on the Youth Ombudsman Office is a place where being able to have been on both sides of the table gives me a unique perspective about it. So as a teenager in the youth in care, I was a part of a sibling group of three. I was also a teen mom. So I came into care very parentified and um, very aware of utilizing resources, and things like that. But I still felt powerless once I entered the system. I definitely felt unheard, undervalued, and even silenced regarding my own situation. It has been 20 years and there are still those youth who do not feel heard. Those teenagers and youth need to be heard. There is an official and an unofficial record of children who report that when they have reported their concerns, there was never any conversation beyond that. They felt that they weren't listened to. They felt like their concerns didn't matter. And at those moments, who is that teenager supposed to go to? Who is that teenager supposed to call? Like, who can we, who, can we get to listen to them? And so the hope for having that need met is the Youth Ombudsman Office. Uh, this person will listen when others have dismissed or downplayed or minimized the concern. And so I wanted to share a little lesson from my experience um, because I can still remember plainly how it felt to have my feelings disregarded and to be dismissed, quite frankly. And the example that I give is one I, that really resonates both because I personally experienced it and because it recently happened again. So when I was in foster care, the, uh, I was in Canton, Ohio, and I often would be upset because we weren't allowed to sit on the furniture, we weren't allowed to eat some of the snacks that the family members, you know, of the, the, the family that housed us, uh, our placement allowed. And one time I really got into an argument with the foster mom because my son's diapers were so cheap. As soon as he peed, he was right out. It was just all over the place. And that was upsetting for me. And so as I got into this argument with the foster mom, she had shared with her adult children um, my, my feelings and my frustrations and the fact that I was talking back. And I remember being in the room with my two kids and my sister was upstairs. And I remember them specifically saying um, really degrading remarks about me, about my, the fact that I was a foster child, about being a teen mom. And I'm in earshot. That wasn't the only time, but this day it stuck out because I was so frustrated, I wanted to go out there and confront them. And I'm grateful that I did not. But that happened all the time. They were able to say stuff when I was in earshot. In fact, 
there was times when I wasn't even out of the room. And so I sat in despair as the adults in that home made it clear that the same laws that bind that foster parents' hands did not apply to them. In my case, I reached out to another uh, foster worker, another ally of mine, and she was able to help me. But I, my heart goes out to those that do not. I don't know if you all can recall um, the Micaiah Bryant case. I think of her so many times because I believe that a youth ombudsman could have helped me. It could have given me hope to really get through that situation until I was able to get to my next placement. And when I think of Micaiah Bryant, who tragically lost her life after having an altercation in the foster home, I, I am all the more determined to ensure that this youth ombudsman comes to fruition. While there are aspects of this that may be debatable, what is not up for debate is the familiar refrain that the fact that the girls of this home felt that they did not have any other, any other place, um, any other person to call to address their concerns. The bottom line is that they deserve to be heard. The fact that there were many issues in, in this home and they felt that they didn't have anyone else to go to if they went to their worker and they went to the supervisor and they went up the chain that they felt like they had to go to and they still felt like they didn't have their needs met, who are they supposed to go to, right? So the bottom line is we need this youth ombudsman office. We need it to be youth focused. We need it to be youth led and we need it to be um, we need it to be separate, you know, um, and I, I definitely think that there are reasons to hope beyond the Youth Ombudsman Office addressing racism, safe babies court, um, really honing in the first family prevention services, obviously the children's trans children's services transformation, but where I'm at now is this Youth Ombudsman can be transformative it can be a voice when we feel that we don't have anyone to speak to. And when we think about the data that really speaks to this, when we get to the data that really speaks to this, um, it's really undeniable the impact that this ombudsman office can have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Layla Rose. Hello again. Um, so today I really wanted to talk about kind of what comes after our youth ombudsman gets put in and all of that good stuff. Um, and it's been a long journey. So I'm so happy to be able to say that sentence, you know, that we are going to get this youth specific independent office. I think it's so important and so overdue. Um, however, I think that it's also important to supplement the data that we have currently on children that are being abused in foster care. Um, due to my lived experience in foster care, I did have the privilege of getting to work with the Children's Services Transformation Office. And I think it was particularly frustrating for me because there is an assumption that's kind of um, backed up by official data that once children are placed in foster care, they're safe. You know, they're put in vetted placements nothing they've been taken out of a bad situation and put into a good one and if you looked at the official national data that would confirm that belief um, because according to uh, the official national data um, if you take an average across the country less than one percent of foster youth are abused while in the system and you know if you've ever worked with foster youth you just already automatically know that that number cannot be right. Um, if you if you gathered a group of 100 foster youth into a room and asked them how many of them had been maltreated during their time in care, I guarantee you it would be far above 1% of that room. And um, just my experience alone, if the data was correct, I would be a statistical impossibility. I had over 10 placements, um, I believe, and within the span of 10 years, and multiple placements were abusive in a number of ways. And if 
those numbers were actually correct, then um, I wouldn't have happened. My life would not have been able to happen the way it was. And that's just one indicator that um, we need to do better collecting this data. We know better, so it's time to do better. And um, I think it's so, it's so frustrating because you can't take this issue to a legislature with the data being the way it is, because they'll look at this less than 1% national average and they say, oh, well, this isn't a problem. We're doing well with this because there are cases that don't get reported because we don't yet have an ombudsman office. Um, there are cases that get reported, but for reasons that aren't quite clear are never substantiated. Um, and we can't solve this problem until we can understand its scope. And so I think um, one way that we could go about doing that is designing a youth experience survey, not an exit survey, but something like a quarterly survey that can be anonymous, but taken from youth that we can match up against what the official data says, an accountability measure to make sure that the numbers we're reporting are reflecting reality. Um, I think ideally these, the questions that would be asked would be, have you ever experienced maltreatment in care? Are you experiencing maltreatment in your current placement? Have you ever reported maltreatment in care? What were the results of that report? Just questions like that, just to give us a baseline um, because currently, all qualitative data on abuse in foster care directly contradicts official data in a way that's so problematic that I can't believe that it hasn't been addressed yet. And that's why we're here today, you know, trying to really bring awareness to this cause because we do want our kids to be safe. That is the top priority. We, you know, if we have to put them through the trauma of removing them from their home, it's our responsibility, it's our onus to make sure that they're going somewhere where they're safe and where um, if they're not safe, we can immediately intervene and we are aware of the um, scope of the situation that's going on so we can get a handle on it. I know that you know there's only so much we can do and that vetting can never be perfect, but we can do better for our kids, I think. Um, and that's on that topic on kind of an unrelated note. I also just wanted to briefly talk about um, tuition waivers for children in foster care. Other states have implemented them. Personally, I went through foster care in Alabama and I'm amazed <laughs> that they implemented a tuition waiver for foster children, but they did. And I do believe it was using CHAPI dollars. It was federal funds and it was all a youth effort. It was a youth lobbying effort. We went to um, the state capitol and we explained why it was so important for us to get a tuition assistance. It didn't kick in until my junior year of undergrad, but I still got some benefit from it when they ultimately decided to petition for federal dollars um, for tuition waivers. And I mean, I am going to have a law school education and still a substantial amount of debt. And I can't even put into words just how important it is to help these kids out financially. Um, you know, it's already kind of questionable for an 18 year old to take out, however, that thousands and thousands of dollars of debt, but just imagine an 18 year old who has no family, no support system, no one to help them make those repayments if they're not able to get immediately employed right after college. Um, so just that help of, you know, avoiding crippling amounts of debt, it, you know, it's, it would help these out poor outcomes that we see so much just because you know it already has in um, Alabama you have a lot more foster kids going to college because every state school for them is essentially tuition free if they can get in they can go and so they don't they have one less burden one less obstacle in their way um, of achieving success and achieving those desirable outcomes we really wanna see for all of our kids. And the thing is the tuition waivers also will apply to trade schools you know, and other programs like that. So if a kiddo is not college oriented, that's fine. you know. And I think it's so important to try to expand that program. I think it should be in all 50 states, but definitely including Ohio.
And I think that that could help bring us out of that bottom percentile. And um, that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you so much for listening and for your time. And I'm going to pass it back to Kim now. Thanks, Leila Rose. And I, you know, I should mention too that I, my mom actually aged out of foster care when she, uh, but she grew up in Connecticut. And at the time in Connecticut, um, she was able to go to a private out of state college for free. Um, and she had a room and board and tuition all covered. And I was actually able to go to that same college as a legacy student. So that I just think that as we invest in youth, you know, there's generations that benefit from that. And we can see like, just that that, um, yeah, in, improving outcomes for youth and, and really investing in youth, I think is so strategic. Um, so I do wanna just, um, if we can go to the next slide. Oh, yes, she's already there, thank you. Um, so for the key takeaways, you know, we, we put a lot of thought into this report and if you go away with um, anything, I want you to just um, remember that we're very grateful for leadership in Ohio. Um, leaders do recognize that there are challenges and they're doing a lot to invest. And um, we just continue to um, try to figure out new ways that we can ensure the safety of youth. So thinking about these measures, thinking about how can we continue to have um, you know, continuous quality improvement and really looking at the data. Um, but within that, we have to focus on those performance measures that matter to youth. So asking for their, uh, you know, experience um, and really including youth interviews in those performance measures. So how are we capturing that data? Right now we do exit interviews, right? So once a youth has left, um, their placement, they're interviewed about how that placement was. But I would argue that's too late. They should be asked that frequently. They should be asked that um, while they're still in that placement. Um, and so, you know, and imagining how we use those types of interviews as part of our um, performance measures. And then, of course, you know, thinking about the ways that we use data from, you know, the education system, for example, to really connect how our youth are doing in school and, and with graduation rates and things like that um, can really help us to kind of move the needle and ensure that um, these reform efforts are working. Um, so with that, um, you know, obviously we understand that there's lots of challenges with this and there's also a lot of intersections, right? So the, the kind of recommendations of this report, I think intersect a lot with the youth ombudsman office. And so um, I thought Deanna, if you wanna spend a little bit more time just talking about some of the challenges and intersections that, um, that you've kind of as a caseworker and as somebody who's a lot, has a lot of experience, um, if you want to go to the next slide, Allison, and just you know talk through some of that. Sure. Um, my my internet is freezing, so I'm going to go off camera for a second. I sincerely apologize, to everyone. But um, I am also honored because I did value my time as a caseworker, right? And I do um, love the fact that we are also looking at that there would be some um, challenges for the caseworkers where I can perceive that they would feel like. Um, their workload and they're already overloaded and this might be one more thing to do, but I think that the way that this can be done can be done in a way that is not an additional task for the caseworkers to um, add on their plate. And so, because um, what I want to do also is really look at the um, challenges surrounding data collection, because I know that there are biases that are possible right, along the various stages of data collection. In the initial stages of establishing the framework um, for the survey or tool that we could use would be the interpretation of the data and what is being measured. So how are we measuring that? Who is setting those parameters, right? And then there is bias for both the person giving the interview and answering the questions. So we do want to acknowledge that those are some of the challenges and when you think about trying to uh, account for those things, it could feel like it could be um, cumbersome on the worker, right? And so we do just wanna acknowledge that. And then another challenge to data collection would be both capturing the data and ensuring anonymity 
of the youth submitting to the survey. So how can we guarantee anonymity in a way that will allow the youth to speak freely while addressing those concerns? And I think that that is where the Youth Ombudsman's Office comes in, because the Youth Ombudsman has the privilege of ensuring that our foster youth rights and um, um, you know, their concerns are being addressed and their rights are being protected, right? Because foster youth have rights. And so this utilizing these surveys and utilizing this data can um, really help to paint a more qualitative picture about the child's youth or the child's stay in care. So what I'm what we are suggesting is that the ombudsman can collect the data on outcomes and the effectiveness of interventions on a more pointed scale. Um, it can also look at um, what considerations that must be thought through, thought, thought through. Why am I, it's like I go off camera and I've got um, a stammering tongue today. But the ombudsman can be the person or the office that thinks through uh, the concerns and the nuances before implementing the survey, as well as helping to establish clear roles around who is responsible for analyzing the data who has permission to view the names on it. And I also want to touch on the importance and the place of um, this data from the caseworker perspective, because CQI or continuous quality improvement drives everything that we do. Data drives everything the worker does because it drives the policy that governs the work. It drives the interventions that are available. It drives everything. And so stats are run and reported every week by the supervisors to the associate directors in the county where I served. Um, and one of the things that they strived for, to their credit, was ensuring accurate data. Um, and so that data affects, like I said, the workers work on multiple levels. But when we were establishing the youth focus groups, um, they were concerned about the issues that I listed before and the perimeters that would need to be set to make sure that this was done effectively. And I think the Youth Ombudsman Office can do that. And so I want to lift up the possibility of utilizing liaisons, right, with um, the state education agencies, the local education agencies, because uh, by law they're required to have them. But how many youth are really utilizing them? Utilizing them are really getting the benefit of having a liaison. How many of you know that that's a right and that's something that they can utilize? I didn't know that, right? I did not know that as a worker and I certainly didn't know it as a youth. Um, and then we also wanna look up the idea of um, the youth experience surveys like Kim talked about and um, just really letting someone other than the primary worker do them. Um, and so one suggestion could be that they're completed alongside the 90-day uh, reviews that are done or the SARs that are done um, in the counties. That gives them an opportunity to complete the survey. And if they can't make it to the SAR or the 90-day review, that they can still have their voice captured because the 90-day review is something that not every case gets. And it is the... the the agency's perspective on what's being done on the case. Whereas this youth experience survey is youth driven and it captures, captures a qualitative picture, a qualitative snapshot of what the youth is experiencing. So, um, you know, even to the point of, you know, the frequency or, or um, the exit interviews, I feel like there's still a qualitative piece that the ombudsman can really uh, champion and hold um, and so it's just another benefit to having that in place. So if we utilize other staff to do this, such as the ombudsman office, um, I feel like it can still be done and capture a qualitative uh, snapshot of use experience while not burdening the worker. Because I do know that, you know, especially now, they have so much on their plate. And I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, lift that up. So, um, but we really want the, the data effort, the data collection efforts to capture their voice, to capture their issues, to ensuring that decisions about them are not window dressing. The ombudsman is really our reason to hope for that. 
Um, and so when we think about even um, the status updates, you know, it's going really well. It's actually getting ready to be implemented. Um, there was, um, I think it's going to be up and running, you know, this summer. And so um, I'm really, really excited, but I did want to lift up the possibility that they can uh, really account for getting, getting this qualitative uh, picture through the youth experience surveys while addressing accounting for the biases in the data or helping to account for the biases in the data and the importance of even the survey design. Them having an input in that and possibly even holding that can make a huge difference in um, buy-in and participation with that. And so one aspect of the Youth Ombudsman Office that I really like is the proactive role. Because they're not uh, case carrying, they can look forward and look for other ways that they can be proactive in protecting youth's rights and looking at their qualitative stay in care and making sure their concerns are heard uh, and that they the youth really feel supported in addressing those concerns. And so lastly, I wanted to talk about um, initiatives in other states um, when it comes to the Youth Ombudsman Office. Um, this is starting to catch fire. There's Ombudsman's office in other states. And there is um, a report, I think it was in West Virginia, and Kim, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But when they looked at how the Ombudsman office was served, they didn't see uh, outcomes for youth. And so it really lifted up that the youth Ombudsman office should be separate. It has to be an intentionality to make sure that their concerns are um, addressed. And so um, I just wanted to lift that up as well. There's so many benefits, there's so many facets that the um, Youth Ombudsman Office can um, benefit our youth and the caseworkers, like I, I talked about, because all of those things can be reasons why caseworkers don't buy into this. And having the Ombudsman really champion this and having a an uh, impact in it or a, um, input on it and even holding it really can account for that to ensuring that we get these surveys out. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Kim. Thanks, Deanna. And, you know, like I mentioned, we, we I talked to a lot of people who've been in foster care. And one of the questions, you know, I asked uh, a young man, young man, like, what, what would you put on the survey? Um, and he's like, are you aware of your rights? Do you know about the Foster Youth Bill of Rights? And I was just like, that's perfect, because if we can track that, if we can um, assess, you know, how many youth know about the Foster Youth Bill of Rights and know about the Youth Ombudsman Office, then, the, then that's another kind of proactive role that the Youth Ombudsman can play. If they're able to have access to that survey data and know, you know, in this particular area or this region, there really isn't as much awareness about this, then they can kind of target some of their outreach efforts. Um, you know, if there's other areas where it's been pretty widespread and people are really kind of aware of it, then, you know, maybe they don't spend as much proactive attention in those areas. So I really feel like there's a lot of intersection there between these two offices. <clears throat> there was another young woman in our, uh, one of the focus groups who just talked about how important it is to um, just have data that tra tracks trends. Um, so if we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, if, if we can identify, you know, placements that maybe there's a, a for-profit placement private agency that we're seeing um, has a lot of feedback around that placement that is not good, you know, then there's, there's possibility there that we can kind of look into system failures um, in certain, for certain agencies. So I really feel like there's some uh, intersections between the, this new office and the data that we're talking about. Let me ask um, Layla Rose if she wants to comment on that too. Sure, so as um, a graduating law student and an almost baby attorney, I think one uh, concern that I have just generally about the foster care bill of rights, um, first of all, is the point that you noted that I feel like a lot of kids don't know about it, but also um, 
as time goes on, I would love to see enforcement mechanisms for it because in law school, we say what's a right without a remedy. Um, so I would love to see, you know, if, if a child's rights according to the uh, foster care bill of rights is violated, that they have some sort of um, mechanism to address that and have it um, taken care of so that they're not, so they're no longer experiencing a rights violation. I think it's important to both know your rights and have a way to enforce them. Exactly. Yeah, and I really see the youth ombudsman kind of as, of course, I, I, I definitely want to make it clear that um, that the youth ombudsman office really is kind of like the place where you go when other options have failed, right? And so that is kind of the place where you see if your rights have been violated and your concerns have been dismissed through the typical channels that, you know, through your caseworker and um, through your, you know, the county agencies, that youth ombudsman is, is sort of that uh, enforcement to make sure that um, kids don't fall through the cracks. <clears throat> so with that, um, I wanted to see if there were any questions. I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So um, my colleague Allison uh, is going to help us monitor the chat. Were there any questions that uh, came up? Thanks, Kim. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. And just a reminder to everyone joining us, um, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A feature or the chat box. And so just one first question. Um, one of our attendees says that they were not aware that there was actually a Foster Youth Bill of Rights. Could one of you um, maybe quickly put a link to that in the chat while I go through some of the other questions, just to make sure that we um, have um, a resource to access that. And by the way, we'll be also sending out all the materials and slides from this webinar to everyone who's attended today, and we'll make sure to include a link to that um, in that email and all of our other resources as well. And I will so, that right now. Great, thank you, Kim. And so, actually, we have two kind of first clarifying questions about the data that might be uh, best suited for you, Kim. Uh, the first is, do, you, do we have a breakdown of the foster youth who aged out of care um, by county in Ohio? That's included in our um, data profiles, right? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, so one kind of caveat to that is, um, as far as the data there, um, <clears throat> if, if a county is fairly small, and if there were fewer than 10 young people who aged out, uh, that data won't necessarily appear because it's been masked for privacy considerations. But yes, for many of the larger counties, you can find that information in those county profiles and it'll show kind of the trend. We looked at a uh, trend over three years, you know, and I do wanna to highlight too, there are um, some really wonderful examples of, of states who've developed these types of dashboards. Um, and Florida is one of those that has um, a really robust way of looking at this. So we've modeled our dashboard in some, I mean, it's not, it doesn't look anything like Florida's, but what it does provide a model of ways that we think that the state should be consolidating information in a way that's easily accessible so that um, all practitioners and, and people, you know, put with stakeholders should be able to kind of see how the state is doing on, on these measures. So yes, that is available. Okay, and, um, Go ahead. Just wanted to flag that the link to the foster care uh, bill of rights is now in the chat. So go ahead, Ken. Well, and I would just note, you know, the the we all Ohio does have a nice dashboard. I think the step further that Florida has taken is really trying to establish those kind of targets, right? So it's it's able to um, say these are the measures that are important to us, and this is where this is the direction we should be heading in those measures. So we have a great question here um, from Kathleen. She says, I would be interested in hearing the top three to five questions that the court should ask the youth when that youth attends a child welfare hearing. Also, any suggestions about a response by the court that would make the youth understand that the youth is heard? And I guess that would be for, for anyone. Well, um, you know, 
Go ahead, Leila Rose. I want, I want you to talk, please. I can jump in. Um, for the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that question was I would want the judge to give the youth an option when they're asking that question if they would rather do it in private because sometimes at those hearings, maybe parents, foster parents, social workers, somebody, the child may not be comfortable um, being candid in front of maybe there. So I think first of all, before they ask any questions, I would want the judge to say, hey, I would like to speak with you about you know, your input on your case. Um, are you okay with doing that here in open court or would you prefer to do this in my chambers? And I think, you know, similar to what they do in custody hearings with smaller children sometimes um, so that they don't have to testify in court or all that good stuff. Um, I think that would be a good idea. And then ideally, um, I think a judge should ask wherever they're currently placed um, if they feel safe, um, if they're happy, um, and if not, you know, what would they want, how would they want to see their situation change or improve and what could the judge do to help them be where they wanted to be in the situation, in the kind of situation that they wanted to be in. And of course with children, you know, sometimes it won't be feasible, but at least having, empowering them to give them that voice to say, hey, this is your life. I want to know what you want um, and what would be ideal for you. I think that that all by itself is more than we afford children most of the time and would be such a key component. She took the words right out of my mouth in terms of asking in chambers and asking what they would want to see different about their situation. Um, I would also ask them to um, really ask about like allies. Like, do you feel like you have someone that you can talk to if you're not feeling safe, if you're not feeling happy. Uh, and the reason for that is because we know that youth have, uh, or some youth have uh, guardian ad litems, but guardian ad litems are not necessarily um, always the mouthpiece for the child. They may come in at the 11th hour asking what happened over the past X amount of months, and then they stand in court and report having never really had that conversation with the child. And so really empowering that child to lift up that, you know, do you have someone that you can talk to? Um, do you feel like you have an ally in that? And obviously on an um, age appropriate level, but that's the only thing I would add to what Layla Rose said. Well put. And I would say too, if you look through the report, you know, we asked, now this is more so from the perspective of, um, you know, the surveys, but we did ask young people, like, what, what would you include in the survey? And so there are some um, other examples in there um, as far as, you know, how many caseworkers have you had and what's your, what's the quality of your relationship or how would you rate your relationship with your caseworker? And I think that's important because one young man just talked about how important it is for that relationship. Like if that relationship is going well, that it can really pave the way for good outcomes. And if that relationship is not going well, for whatever reason, um, you know, that can really be a limitation because the caseworker knows a lot and can really open doors. Um, and if the, if a young person's just unwilling or unable to kind of connect with that person, then I think that that poses some challenges to that. So that was one, uh, per, another person's perspective who's not, wasn't, you know, uh, isn't joining us today, but I thought that was really important to elevate as well. Great. Thank you all. We have one question here regarding specifically the youth ombudsman office. So how would a current foster child contact the ombudsman office? What if they don't have permission to use the foster parent's phone to call and they do not have a cell phone? I'll jump in and just say that, you know, we, the, the ombuds office is in process. So we have, we have not appointed the youth ombudsman yet, um, but that selection is in process. And, the goal is to have that person in the office and starting, you know, to take those phone calls as early as May 31st. So, um, so there will be a hotline, but there will also be like a website where you can um, 
fill out, you know, kind of like a contact information form that you can fill out and use that as well. So those are right now the two avenues that are being considered. Um, and I will just say, I want to give a lot of, um, you know, kudos to the administration for allowing the Youth Advisory Board to have a significant role in the way that that these ombuds office is being developed because, um, you know, the Youth Advisory Board is a, is a group of young people aged 14 to 24 who, um, you know, have been, you know, involved with advocacy efforts and um, are organized and so they are able to, you know, do focus groups and provide input. And so it will have the Youth Ombuds Office will have its own separate website, um, its own URL, so that youth can, um, you know, it's kind of tailored to youth specifically. Which I think, you know, Deanna mentioned earlier about West Virginia, who didn't go that route, right? They have more like a child welfare ombudsman, and so that office really isn't serving youth. It hasn't really had much youth interaction. Um, it's mostly targeted towards kinship. Uh, providers, but bi biological parents and foster parents, you know, foster caregivers. So, uh, so okay. yeah, was, yeah, go ahead, Deanna. I'm uh, sorry. I also wanted to say that the youth also suggested, and I know that they were looking at making sure that the website was available at schools, because, you know, on school computers, there's only certain websites that people can get on. And so um, there's also conversation of trying to work that in as well. And um, possibly even doing like a, um, um, a QR code. So they're still trying to figure out how many avenues they can put in place, but they do acknowledge that that is something that they're going to have to account for, making sure that the youth has access to get to the ombudsman office. I did want to mention too, and I'll, I'll see if I, I, I failed to find this link in advance, but the youth, that, so that there's, there's going to be a youth and family ombuds office in which both the youth ombudsman and the family ombudsman will be appointed. So the family ombudsman is really going to be targeted towards those adults, like I said, the, the, the guardians, the, um, you know, the kinship providers, the caregivers, the, that's kind of their avenue is the family ombudsman and the youth ombudsman will really be focused on youth in care or, you know, youth who have been affected by the system in some way. Um, so uh, what I did want to mention, though, is that there are some, uh, right, currently they're going to have two region, um, kind of like regional ombuds people who are underneath the, the kind of two appointees. Um, and those positions are actually being selected right now. And there's a, um, I think that the window for that closes today. And I was going to see if I could put that link in the chat as well. So if you know anybody who's like a, a wonderfully strong advocate for youth who would be interested in applying for that role, um, I think that would be an excellent opportunity. Okay, and, and just really quickly regarding the ombudsman, um, how many, so within this office, how many ombudsmen will there be? So there, yeah, so there will be two um, appointed, so by the governor appointed, and then there will be two assistant ombuds people. So kind of think of it as like two for the youth outside and two for the adult side. Um, the two that are, at, so there will be kind of like the two regional ombuds people will be higher, you know, kind of, and then the two um, leaders would be appointed. So I will see if I can find that link really quickly. And so I think we have time for um, maybe, maybe one more question. Um, one person asks, I was curious why every county does not have a CASA rep representation and how do we make sure this happens so that the child has a voice to talk to on a regular basis? Going to court for a foster youth is rare and oftentimes um, I think may not happen at all. Um, I can kind of speak to that a little bit. Uh, so it, at that point, it might not be that you need necessarily a GAL. You might just want the child to have, well, Ideally, like I said in the chat, you'd want the child to have an attorney and a GAL, but in situations where they're not going to court, you'd want the child to have an attorney because there is a court that has continuing jurisdiction over the case. So even if they're not regularly going to court, they could go to court if an issue was raised, if a child like brought up an issue to their attorney. Um, so just, I think, fostering those relationships and having 
it, it would be amazing if every child in the system could have an attorney and a GAL because the GAL is kind of, you know, this voice of reason, this best interest. And then an attorney is just um this is what the child wants they want to go home they want to live with so and so and you know when you have someone who is focused on what the child wants you may end up in those situations where you're in court more often because um when there is an issue they have someone they can speak up to who can make something happen as far as court dates and things like that Any other thoughts on that? Okay, well, in that case, I know we're at time. So um, I might turn over to you, Kim, for any other last words. Yeah, so no, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Layla Rose. I just have so much admiration for both of you for speaking up and um, just being awesome people in general. So. Of course, if you uh, want to follow up with me, I uh, my email address is in the chat, and I would love to hear your thoughts. When I started this report, you know, I really wanted it to be the start of a conversation, and I really value kind of the interaction and the you know the feedback and the insights. So um, hopefully that this conversation will continue, and I'd love to come and talk again if people are interested. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>